You are listening to Everyday Evidence, presented by the American Occupational Therapy Association, helping the occupational therapy practitioner apply evidence to practice. Here's your host, Matt Brandenburg. All right, today we are joined by Dr. Julie Dorsey. Dr. Dorsey is an associate professor and chair of the Occupational Therapy Department at Ithaca College in New York. Julie has extensive experience in ergonomics and environmental design, as well as community-based programming and health and wellness. She currently serves as the chair of the American Occupational Therapy Association's Commission on Practice. The Commission on Practice recently revised and authored the Occupational Therapy Practice Framework, 4th edition, a publication that may be considered the guiding document of our profession and the topic of our interview today. Thanks for being on the show today, Julie. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. I'm excited to be here. I just wanted to say on the very first day of OT school, I was introduced to the Occupational Therapy Practice Framework, but the third edition um, really has the document that articulates our profession's domain and outlines its process of service delivery. Um, So it was referred to throughout my curriculum and learning. That makes me really excited to hear about some of the updates and changes that have been made. So before we go into all that, I wanted to ask you for kind of an overview of the OTPF and uh, the document's revision process. Sure. Um, I actually want to say that I remember in OT school being introduced to Uniform Terminology 3, which uh, predated the practice framework. Um, And then when I was a practitioner, transitioning to using the practice framework, and then when I moved into the role of educator, one of my very first classes I had to teach was related to the practice framework. So I was thrilled uh, to have a chance to be part of this revision process. And I know how important the document is. Um, And I thought maybe I could start by sharing a little bit about Um, the importance of the occupational therapy practice framework, um, and in particular, then we'll get into the fourth edition. That would be wonderful. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think one of the most important things about the framework is how it helps to articulate our scope of practice. We have other official documents that draw from the framework to state our scope, um, but they all are stemming from the practice framework. Um, The document helps us to talk about our distinct perspectives as occupational therapy practitioners and our contributions to promoting health and participation, right, in all of our clients at person, group, and population level. The document gives us a common language uh, to talk about our profession, which is really helpful for unifying our identity. Uh, As we just talked about, it's used in education. Um, It definitely supports research uh, and can be useful for advocacy for the profession, both by practitioners and by policymakers, including our AOTA um, policy and and regulatory staff. Thank you. That really highlights how important of a document this is and also how much it encompasses um, about our profession. Julie, what would you say is the overarching purpose of the review and revision process of the OTPF? Sure. So every official document that um, AOTA has goes through a standard five-year review. And the purpose of that review is the same for all documents, right? That we want to make sure that the documents that we have published and available support current practice, and then also look towards how we can advance practice to make sure that we're meeting society's changing needs. So that's really the main purpose of the revision. Um, This, again, was the the third revision, right, the fourth edition, um, but sort of the third revision from when the document first came um, into publication in 2002. Um, And a lot has shifted. And even in five years, a lot can change. Even in the review process, (laughs) you'll hear me talk about it in a little bit, but over the course of the two years, a lot changed. We were in a pandemic by the time this got approved. So Um, You know, we need to constantly update our official documents to make sure that they accurately reflect what we need to do in practice and how we need to look towards supporting future practice. Absolutely. And can you go ahead and tell us about that revision process? Uh, You said part of it changed due to the the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you give us some other background on, on what the process looks like? 
Yeah, definitely. So we started in about the summer of 2018 uh, and we initiated the review process. And when I say we, I mean the Commission on Practice um, with an open AOTA member feedback survey. So this is where we put out the third edition and said, what needs to be changed, right? You've all been using this for the last four years or so at that time. And um, what needs to be edited in the document? What needs to be added? Um, what needs to be strengthened or clarified? So that was really useful to get um, input. We also did some open listening sessions in the beginning and met with some stakeholder groups to get additional feedback. And then that helped us to put uh, to start to actually edit the document. Over the next year and a half or so, the commission made uh, made those edits, had multiple drafts. We had a few uh, on-site visits at AOTA headquarters, you know, when we used to be able to do things in person um, where we sat in a working room with textbooks and articles and um, really dug into the literature and had uh, amazing conversations about how to integrate the feedback and, again, how do we support and advance practice through this document. That ultimately led to a final draft uh, that went out for AOTA member review around, I want to say, November of 2019. Uh, and then feedback was incorporated and final edits were made to the document. And it went to the representative assembly as a, a motion for vote and approval at the beginning of 2020. And at that time, there was another feedback survey for um, AOTA members to give feedback on that draft. Uh, after that, it went to RA representative assembly task groups for additional editing. Um, and then there was a final vote in May 2020 uh, that would have, uh, if it was pre-pandemic times, would have taken place at AOTA conference, but it was shifted to online, again, given the, the current state of of what was happening, um, but we were so thrilled to get a positive vote and approval by the Representative Assembly. The pre-press edition went online on the AOTA website in June 2020, and then it was published in AJOP, the American Journal of Occupational Therapy, in August 2020. So really over two years, we had about a thousand members provide input, which was pretty amazing. That really is amazing. And I love how the Commission of Practice really emphasized getting that input and feedback from practitioners, um, because this is a document that affects our profession as a whole. Yeah. Thank, thank you for giving us a little sneak peek into how that works. Yeah. And I have to say that the feedback we got was incredibly helpful. It would help to push us and think beyond you know, what the members of the commission could conceptualize and, and really hearing from what was needed um, directly from practitioners who were using the document or wanted to use the document. And, and those members include students as well. We had a lot of student voices, which was great. So the feedback was really critical in, in making a document that um, we hope meets everybody's needs. Absolutely. Well, in, in that case, we'll encourage all our listeners to participate in, in giving feedback uh, during the next set of revisions for the OTPF. Yeah. Absolutely. Julie, I know the practice framework is a major document. I believe it's around 100 pages of content, mm -hmm. uh, which is a lot to consume and digest. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to highlight and address all the changes that come with this update. Um, but before we dive into uh, talking about those changes, I want to ask, what resources or supports are there available to help practitioners learn about the changes in the new edition and understand their implications? Yeah, that's a great question. At the beginning of the practice framework, the fourth edition, um, there's actually a summary of all of the major changes. So there's a bulleted list that gives an overview. So that's a quick way. If you're going to be looking at this for the first time, it's in one of the beginning pages, like page two or three of the AJOT article version. And uh, it'll give you the highlights and really a snapshot of what's changed and then can uh, help help you focus in on the areas that you want to look at. Um, so I would suggest starting there. Each version of the framework um, has that. So you can sort of track the, the changes over time, which I think is really interesting is to look at how the document has evolved in you know about two decades now. 
Um, additionally, a, a continuing education article just was published in OT Practice um, in February 2021, and that highlights specifically the addition of the cornerstones, and, as well as the expansion um, and clarification of health management as an occupation. So I think that's a really useful, kind of friendly um, article to highlight those specific changes. Um, there is a continuing education course that AOTA publishes through um, their website that goes in, in pretty significant detail on all the changes um, and through the whole framework um, and has some case studies at the end for application. Uh, and then the final thing I'll mention is that um, in April 2021, the Commission on Practices presenting through AOTA Inspire um, on an update, a session that talks about the updates of, on the framework. And we have three pretty in-depth case studies that we'll go over for application. We'll have one at the person level, one at group, and one at population. So lots of resources. The commission's been busy this last year trying to work on de uh, disseminating uh, this important document and getting into the, the hands of, of the people who could really use it to guide practice. Absolutely. Thank you for highlighting some of those resources. This may be just kind of a, a personal curiosity question. Uh, you mentioned the practice framework was published in AJOT, so it's available for free to all AOTA members. If someone's not a member of AOTA, can they still purchase the, the document? Do they have free access to it or, or how does that work? Yeah, so you can purchase it through the AOTA store online. And then um, anyone who is affiliated with um, an educational institution will be able to access AJOT through various databases. And then I believe there are some resources through NPCOT as well, where you can access certain databases, which could get you free access to um, AJOT. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and go through some of the major changes to the OTPF fourth edition. We'll get back to our interview right after this quick message. You all know we really try to make research more consumable and applicable on everyday evidence. But did you know that just one minute of your time could help us to improve the show, improve the resources the American Occupational Therapy Association provides for practitioners, and improve the application of evidence to practice within our whole field? Please take our one-minute survey. It's only three questions, and you can find the link in this and every episode's description and support the AOTA in continued efforts to improve our podcasts and to improve the translation of research to practice. Now back to the interview. Um, you already mentioned this briefly about the addition of cornerstones of occupational therapy practice. So Julie, what are the four cornerstones? The four cornerstones that are articulated uh, in the framework are core values and beliefs rooted in occupation, knowledge and expertise in therapeutic use of occupation, professional behaviors and dispositions, and then therapeutic use of self. Awesome. Thank you. And I, I was reading a little bit in uh, those summarized bullet points at the beginning of the OTPF that you mm -hmm. mentioned, um, and it mentions that these cornerstones play an important role in what is referred to as the transactional relationship between the domain and process of occupational therapy. Can you expound on that? Can you describe what this transactional relationship is for us and how those cornerstones come into play? Sure. So figure one, which is actually new in the framework, it shows the domain surrounding the process of OT with no real distinction between the two. There's sort of a fuzzy blur line and blending of, we used colors in there. And that's part of what's trying to uh, articulate this transactional relationship, right? That each influences and is influenced by the other. So considering, for example, occupations, context, performance patterns, part of the domain influences how we're going to deliver our services, right? But then in the service delivery process, we're going to learn more about client factors such as values, beliefs, um, performance skills, and then we make those necessary adjustments. So the constant back and forth is that dynamic transactional relationship. And the practitioner is the facilitator. Uh, and we're anchored with these cornerstones. They, we bring them into the process of OT and use them to, again, facilitate that the OT process. Cornerstones can be defined just out of the dictionary, right? It's something of great significance upon which everything else depends. 
uh, we hear people saying, oh, you know, OT practitioners are distinct. What makes us that way? What sets us apart? And I think the addition of the, the cornerstones helps us to see the critical role that the practitioner plays in the process and we try to seeking to explain that role, right, by identifying these four foundations that really contribute to the success of, of the OT process. Thank you for that explanation. I love it. It really sounds like these cornerstones are so important in practice, but also in advocating for our profession and, and really highlighting what sets us apart and uh, uh, what helps us to add value to, to the healthcare system. Exactly. How, how would you say, Julie, could a practitioner make sure they're developing and relying upon these cornerstones in their practice? I think our educational programs do a great job preparing our students. So certainly through that formal education and our entry level practitioners, but then continuing education and, um, you know, being a lifelong learner and um, continuing to seek information about the use of occupation and how we can strengthen our therapeutic relationship, for example. So certainly through education um, and then through mentorship. So seeing how uh, experienced practitioners are using the cornerstones to, to guide the OT practice. Um, that can certainly be a powerful way for practitioners to continue to develop over time. Um, and then experience, just, you know, developing them um, through your own experiences and, and refining what we know about how to use occupation. And again, that those professional behaviors and dispositions really develop over time. So these are not things that would be set in stone and you graduate from OT school and you have the cornerstones and then, you know, that's it and you're done. Like this is the lifelong learning process and these will be continued to develop. And as people move into diff working with different populations or practice settings, they may need to focus on a particular cornerstone or, or development um, of, of an area, you know, again, to support these transitions that they might have in their careers. And I love that focus. It's almost as if the cornerstones provide like a, a roadmap or a guide um, to, to help practitioners continue improving um, their approach to OT um, and ensuring that, that they're being the best OT they can be um, or o OTA. Absolutely. Well, Julie, I know there's a lot of changes. Uh, so we'll move on to the next one. The OTPF4 identifies three different client types, persons, groups, and populations. So why does the OTPF4 emphasize uh, groups and populations more in this, in this edition? Yeah, I think the, the commission recognized and we heard it loud and clear in membership feedback that, you know, now more than ever, our ability to support the health and well-beings of populations is so crucial. We have this distinctive view that we just talked about as, uh, you know, the cornerstones and what we bring as occupational therapy practitioners into conversations that help to support population health, right, based on the domain of OT. And the practice framework, fourth edition, gives the language and resources to, to help with those conversations. Uh, we can even just consider the pandemic, uh, the current situation, and how that has evolved over the last uh, almost year now, and the widespread impact on communities and populations related to well-being, occupational disruption, mental health, access to health care. So uh, there's these really important roles for OT practitioners to consider the needs of populations and ways in which we can support their health. Some other uh, populations we've been talking about for a while, right? Chronic conditions or addressing mental health um, in youth and adolescents. And for taking those population-based approaches can help us to reach really wide uh, audiences and, and clients and contribute to society's occupational needs. So we thought that this edition needed some more language and resources for practitioners, educators, researchers, students to take the document and then be able to apply it to population level um, services. I love that. If, if the cornerstones are really the foundation on which OT practitioners can can expand their, their practice and their efforts, um, then the document should also provide uh, some guidance in, in how to expand their, their reach into larger groups and population um, level interventions. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the OT domain earlier. There are some changes made to, to each aspect of the domain. Um, so I want to start by asking you about the occupation aspect of the OT domain. 
what changes were made to to this aspect of the, the OT domain? So probably the biggest or most notable change was the addition of health management as a category of occupation. It was in the third edition um, as part of IADLs, and now it's a standalone. And this update really came from feedback from AOTA members that there needs to be this increased focus on OT practitioners addressing health management in order to maintain and improve performance in other categories. So for example, if we have clients who are unable to manage pre-existing conditions like diabetes or congestive heart failure, their ability to participate in work, leisure, social participation, for example, will be impaired. Health management is also important to talk about because OT services are a strong component of keeping people out of hospitals and actively participating in the community. So we really wanted to add that um, explicit mention and, and expanded language on health management to help practitioners um, you know, use that language and use these concepts uh, and integrate them into practice. How would you say, Julie, these changes support and advance occupational therapy practice? Um, you know, I think uh, it, it helps us to really consider the person as a whole and that health management is something that we need to explicitly address, that it, it's not just a, a small piece of the puzzle, but for many of our clients, this could be the key to participating and engaging in other uh, occupations. You know, as I mentioned before, that the health management is really going to underpin the ability to participate in the community or at work. Um, so hopefully that added language and resources will give practitioners those those tools to directly address health management with those clients where, where that's important. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I know I know there were changes to each aspect of the OT domain. Um, so we're going to continue going through each of those aspects. And then the next one up is the context and environments aspect of the OT domain, which was changed to just context now. Can you describe this change and, and why it is so important? Right. So in the third edition, um, environment and context were presented as two distinct components. When updating to the fourth edition, we used the World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning, or the ICF to look at this more broadly. And according to the ICF, context includes environment. So that's why you'll see uh, the title of that section um, as context now. Context includes environmental factors. So there's the mention of environment and personal factors um, that are specific to each client. And that you know, really influence engagement and participation in occupations. In the literature, including OT literature, the terms environment and context were often used interchangeably, but that can be, uh, you know, result in confusion when describing aspects of situations where occupational engagement takes place. So the clarity in the language and saying context is sort of the overarching concept, which then includes environmental factors and personal factors we think give practitioners a clearer language and a clearer um, you know, framework by which to operate and view these really important factors that influence occupational uh, performance and engagement. Awesome. Thank you. I'd, I'd like again how you emphasize the importance of, of having unified language or, or providing language for practitioners. And, and really from your introduction, that's kind of how the practice framework in general developed. Um, was as a document to really unify language and terms and, and usage within our field. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. And I think we were trying to respond to member feedback where we're hearing that there was maybe confusion in terms and we needed clarification in uh, language and, and use of phrases. So we, we tried to have an eye to that in the whole revision process. And context is definitely one example. Awesome. Thank you. Julie, how about the performance pattern section of the OT domain? How has that changed? Um, you know, this version of the framework encourages a wider understanding of daily habits in particular. We tried to give some expanded language there um, to talk about how habits can be automatic, adaptive, or maladaptive, and they also can be healthy or unhealthy, efficient or inefficient, supportive or harmful. So I think the prior editions of the framework tended to focus on habits more as 
always supportive to occupation, which they, they certainly can be, but there's also a side of habits that can be harmful, inefficient, unhealthy. And we thought that was really important to note because that can articulate a role for the practitioner to you know work with a client on some of those habits that are not supporting or they're hindering occupational performance. Um, you know, we also have a more of an emphasis on occupational balance um, in the performance patterns section um, and talking about the connection between how occupational balance is really shaped by context, which we just talked about. So things that, you know, sort of surround the person or are within the person. So like their work hours, their social calendars, their cultural norms, um, and how that those aspects of context really impact occupational balance. Um, so those are a couple of the things that we tried to emphasize in the performance pattern section. And I, I know in this section, some new tables were added. Personally, I, I love a good table. Uh, sometimes I find it hard to, I guess, pick out the correct information when I'm reading a paragraph. Um, but tables are a great way to organize yeah. and kind of emphasize uh, what you should be focusing on. Uh, could you maybe describe these new tables and explain how they can be used to support practice? Yeah, so I'm maybe I'm probably most excited about table seven. Uh, and then table 10 is a close follow-up, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit when we get to that section. But in table seven, it's actually related to performance skills uh, and where we talk about motor and process and, and social skills. These tables, again, we heard loud and clear from members that they wanted to more actionable ways to you know, apply the concept of performance skills and that it was sort of hard in prior versions of the framework to take the list of definitions, so the list of you know, the motor performance skills, um, which, and they had great, you know, definitions, but then what, what do you do with that? How do you evaluate that? How do you intervene? You know, what does that, what does that really mean? So table seven now includes the definitions and then it identifies, there's an example of an occupation uh, and it identifies effective and ineffective performance for clients within that occupational task. So we do that for persons, uh, and then there's a table for groups and looking at, you know, the collective outcomes of groups and how performance can be effective or ineffective and ultimately to, to determine where the OT practitioner could potentially intervene to support the occupational performance. So I think it's such a useful table. It's hard to explain it without you looking at it. So really <laughs> go to table seven, take a look. And that also gives examples of language that can be used right in documentation. That was something we were hearing throughout the feedback process, that practitioners want language that can be put right into their notes and right into their um, reports that they're writing. And this table, I think, really does that beautifully. So I encourage people to take a look and, and see how this could support and advance your practice um, with the addition of those uh, examples on effective and ineffective performance. Thank you. I, I love the emphasis on making all this information a, applicable to practice and, and really supporting the translation from this document into practice uh, through this table. Um, was there a, a specific example from the table you could maybe walk us through on what the uh, performance skill is and, and what uh, an application to an intervention would be? Sure. Um, you know, there's one that talks about washing dishes and the in motor, it's in the motor section and what ineffective and ineffective performance would look like when you're standing at the kitchen sink washing dishes. So the first one under positioning the body talks about stabilizing and effective performance maybe would be that the person moves through the kitchen without propping or having a loss of balance. Ineffective performance could be that they're propping on the counter momentarily to stabilize. And just because it's described as ineffective performance doesn't mean that, um, you know, the person won't be able to complete the task, but it might mean that they need some modifications. So by identifying, okay, this isn't, maybe it's not safe or maybe it's not effective for that person, um, that then identifies how the practitioner could you know, think about interventions um, to address that. Perfect. Thank you for kind of walking us through how the OTPF could be used in developing and, and refining clinical reasoning of, of our practitioners. Can 
you tell me what client factors were enhanced or added in this fourth edition of the OTPF? Yeah. So the definition of psychosocial was, I guess I would call it enhanced, and it was uh, aligned with um, the ICF. So there were some edits there, again, to try to give us some language that is is rooted in the ICF, which is important to align our documents with other guiding documents that other professions use. Um, so that's one. We added um, gender identity uh, in client factors that was added to the category of experience of self and time. Uh, and then interoception was added under sensory functions. So um, those were two new additions, um, gender identity and interoception. Psychosocial was there, but the definition I think was strengthened and again, aligned with the ICF. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. Anything else you wanted to expand on there uh, before moving on to the OT process section? You know, maybe the only other thing to mention is that we tried throughout the document to clearly articulate the difference between and the relationship between activity and occupation, starting in the occupation section in the domain, which is the first section of the domain, and then throughout the examples and throughout the document. I think that that's really important. Again, those um, terms can often be used interchangeably, which is not always correct. Uh, so we tried to give practitioners the um, more descriptions and examples and ways to delineate activity and occupation because occupation is who we are. It's what we do. Um, it's part of the cornerstones. So it's so important, again, that we uh, unify our language and understanding around these concepts. Absolutely. And those two new client factors, gender identity and interoception, uh, what type of recommendations or, I guess, guidelines for practitioners uh, in relation to those client factors are are included in, in the fourth edition? Uh, you know, for all client factors, really, it's considering the impact on performance skills and how, you know, if they're present, how do they support occupational performance? Um, and if they're, or uh, not just that they're present, but there are factors that really need to be considered and then considering that influence on performance. So it's just giving additional things for occupational therapy practitioners to have on their radar and really understand that these are important factors, client factors that um, could influence how people are, you know, moving through this world, experiencing their everyday lives and ultimately engaging in their occupation. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. And so I think that covers a lot of the changes that were made to the OT domain section of this document. What changes were made to the OT process section? Um, let's see. So we can start with uh, kind of the, the background or intro to the process where we talk about service delivery. There was some language added to clarify or uh, more clearly uh, articulate direct and indirect services. And this can be important because there's some different regulatory issues, such as when a referral from a physician or other providers needed, um, differing reimbursement requirements, right, uh, when working with third party payers. It's also important that we understand indirect services uh, in the context of our scope of practice to ensure that we're staying within our license. Um, some language was added about skilled services to further address regulatory issues. So those are some of the, the few background things in the process that kind of then support the actual process, which is defined as the evaluation, intervention, and then outcomes uh, of discharge transition. So that's background stuff. And then I guess I can uh, jump into some of the things that happen in the evaluation section. Screening was added as a possible part of the evaluation process, where I think we all know this as practitioners, but it hadn't been articulated. Um, in prior versions. So that's now named and shows kind of where it would fit in the evaluation process. And then there is sort of a new section that again, was it was implied in the narrative for evaluation, but it wasn't explicit in the supporting table. And like you said, Matt, right, sometimes people just use the tables because it can be hard to digest and pull things out of the narrative. So we wanted to make sure that the tables um, were very clear and included everything. So we added the synthesis of the evaluation process at the end of the evaluation process. So it's like the so what? So you did all the evaluation, but now what? How do you synthesize that information to then use it kind of as the bridge between evaluation and intervention? So I think that's a really valuable piece. 
And then or here's where I talk about table 10, which, like I said, is sort of tied with table 7 as, as my favorite. Um, table 10 was significantly expanded. Table 10 goes through the OT process. So it's again, starts with evaluation and every step of the evaluation, then intervention and everything. It goes from intervention planning to implementation to review and then goes into outcomes. Um, this table now has three columns. And the first column is person, the second or middle column is groups, and then the final column is populations. So this distinction I think is what's incredibly important to support our roles with groups and populations. And it really articulates, you know, for example, what does, what does an occupational profile look like at the population level? Um, well, that might be a needs assessment. What does the outcomes or, or discharge look like? Uh, we know what that looks like at the person level, but what does that look like in population level? Well, we can talk about that as sustainability planning. So it gives that language and kind of compares across the three different clients that we could work with. And I think it just gives such concrete and useful information for practitioners to really know what does the OT process look like across persons, groups, and populations. Thank you. I love that. It's really clear how helpful this document is in, in helping students to learn the OT process, uh, but also it can be helpful for existing practitioners um, to revisit um, and reassess kind of where they're at uh, or even refer to if they're trying to do something new in their practice or, or really expand their their reach in the interventions they're providing. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you, Julie. Uh, now that we know some of the changes and, and updates made to the fourth edition, how would you recommend practitioners use this document in their practice? Well, find your favorite way to access it. We talked about some options. Um, print it. I'm a hard copy person. I like to have a hard copy of it and I keep it nearby to refer to, but you certainly can have it as you know a PDF. So you can have it on your multiple devices and access it that way. But just pull it out, you know, every uh, every chance you have to if you have a question about um, what you're doing or how to articulate what you want to do or advocate for a certain area, you know, go to that framework. I think you'll find a wealth of information to, you know, hopefully help you think about, um, you know, the point you're trying to articulate or the intervention you're trying to plan. It also cites multiple other, I mean, many of that hundred so pages, a lot of those pages are references. So use it as a place to see what key documents you should turn to. Um, if you're not finding exactly what you need in the framework, because again, it can't go into detail in every area of practice. It's more of a global approach but it will point you in the direction of other documents that then you can, you know, maybe find more specifics on what you're looking for. So we can use that to anchor, um, you know, some of your, your clinical decisions that you're making. Uh, I know we talked a lot about the tables and how they're, they're important. And we, we tried to have them stand alone um, at every table. We put a, an introduction at the very top of the table, read those intros because they give context to the table. Um, and they kind of highlight some of the important info from the narrative section, but also read the narrative, <laughs> um, you know, refer back to that because the narratives, you know, add color to the table and just gives more detail. So, you know, the tables are user friendly and the narrative supports that. So those are, you know, some of the tips. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'll be curious to hear, actually, I'd love to hear how people are using it. And I bet that there are other tips that practitioners, students, educators have on how they um, are currently using it. Absolutely. If, if practitioners or students or anyone wants to provide some feedback like that, um, or even share how they're using the OTPF, uh, how do you recommend they do so? They can email COP, so Commission on Practice COP at AOTA.org, and all those get funneled directly to the commission. We read them and we respond. So we'd love to hear your stories. Um, we sort of uh, lived this document for two years. So, uh, you know, we, we really want to hear how it's being received. And, you know, it's never too early to start planning for the next revision. So if people realize, okay, this is what can be expanded to the next one, you know, we've already started notes to pass on to the next commission because we won't be the ones serving necessarily at that time. Um, but we'd love to hear from people on how this is being used. So cop at aota.org. 
Awesome. Thank you, Julie. You've mentioned a number of implications of the OTPF to inform and guide practice, including advocating for uh, self-management intervention and roles in in addressing self-management within practice, um, helping to guide intervention from a individual to group to a population level. Um, what what are some of the other implications of the OTPF to practice? Um, you know, I guess just the idea of scope of practice, our distinct perspectives and contributions. You know, what do we bring to the table that that's distinct from other practitioners? Yeah, that common language. I think you know all the things you said are are just incredibly important. The documents used by um, AOTA staff members, right, who are advocating on Capitol Hill and who are uh, working with state regulatory boards. Um, so, you know, the AOTA policy staff is really crucial in getting this the framework out to various stakeholder groups and, again, to help to influence policy decisions. So I think that that's important and we sometimes maybe don't always think of that in our in our everyday roles. But um, it was fascinating to get to work with the AOTA, um, you know, policy state regulatory folks and get their input and hear how they were using this and, and hear what uh, our stakeholder groups really need in a document like this. Yeah, that does sound very fascinating to, to learn about and, and get more information on. I know we want to encourage creativity and problem solving amongst all practitioners and using this document to guide practice and, and advance their practice. But I want to ask you for a specific example, maybe a case example of using the OTPF to influence and guide OT practice. Could you share one of those with us? Yeah, um, it actually was a, a story that a COP member had told about wanting to start a new program in their hospital and, um, you know, getting some questions on, well, what's what's the OT's role? What would you bring to this area? And they were able to go in the document and pull out language, you know, related to occupation, occupation-based practice, some of the intervention areas that are listed in there and approaches um, and say, hey, look, this is what our profession is saying. And then also, I know we're talking about the framework, but, you know, then they can have pulled in other official documents. Like I was saying before, you know, there are some other official documents specific to the NICU or medication management, um, cognition. So using the framework in conjunction with some other documents that might be more specific to your practice area or setting to say, this is what the professional association says, and here's what we can do. Here's our scope to advocate for a seat at the decision-making table. And ultimately, you know, they're able to get a new program in place um, by saying, here's here's what we would do, here's how we would do it, um, here's what the process, the OT process would look like, and having those documents to support those conversations is really important. Thank you, Julie. That's a, a wonderful example and also illustrates very clearly to me how a practitioner is able to, to take their sphere of influence from a, an individual level and, and one-on-one treatments to then more of a group and, and population level uh, by applying some of the principles of, of our profession and, and this document on a, on a wide scale in a program like that. Well, Julie, what, what other resources would you recommend to our listeners? Um, yeah, so that CE course is titled Exploring the OTPF. You can find that in the AOTA store. I think that that is a really useful tool um, that you can get CE credit for. The OT practice CE article, again, right? We all need our professional development um, units for our licensure and certification. So that article that talks about cornerstones and health management um, is great. Come and visit us at our AOTA Inspire session coming up next month. Um, we'll do a, a live Q&A about the framework. Bring your questions. Tell us how you're using it. You know, and then another resource that you can have, at, you know, outside of AOTA and sort of these structured opportunities is your colleagues, your friends, your OT peers. So if you're in school, start a little reading group um, or a discussion group at your place of employment or, again, with your colleagues who work in other places start a, a group chat or, um, you know, a little uh, shared Google document and, and talk about how you're using it or questions that you have or discuss various concepts. I think that we can each learn from each other and our own interpretation of the framework and, and our application of it and, and hear what others are doing. I think that that can be a really powerful way to dig in by just um, talking to 
your colleagues or your classmates or your co-researchers and just like use it like a, a book group or something. And I love that idea uh, of incorporating community um, into using the OTPF. Uh, that's that's wonderful. And again, Julie, you mentioned if practitioners have questions or feedback uh, to use that email, cop, cop at aota.org. Yeah, definitely. We'd love to hear from you. Well, Julie, in that case, we've come to the golden nugget segment. <laughs> the final question I have for you. If you could give one piece of advice or share one piece of knowledge with practitioners, what would you say? Okay, no pressure, right? Um, <laughs> I was trying to think about this. You know, what what I want people to know, and, and I think what comes to mind is always define our profession and your role as an occupational therapy practitioner by starting with occupation and take the language from the framework. Don't start by saying what we're not. Um, or comparing to other professions, because we are our own selves. We are distinct, as we talked about, and the framework and the language is there to tell you what we do. Use the language from the cornerstones um, in our, our understanding and application of the therapeutic use of occupation. Nobody else does that. That's us. So start that definition with occupation. And I think that will go a long way in helping with our unified identity and helping the, the public to understand who we are and helping our own selves to be able to articulate it, you know, within and outside the profession. So that's, that's my nugget of advice. Thank you, Julie. That's a, a wonderful golden nugget um, and a great point to end on. Uh, thank you again for your time and for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us on the show today. Thanks, Matt. It was so fun. Thanks for having me. And um, I hope that everybody enjoyed learning more about the framework. Absolutely. Yeah, it was our pleasure. Thanks for listening to Everyday Evidence. Tune in next time for more evidence-based practice insights and applications.